Hello and welcome to the Sustainable Apparel Coalition's Drivers of Change podcast series. In this series, we speak to leading voices from within the textile, apparel and fashion supply chain, as well as external experts to discuss how industry can transform in order to tackle the climate crisis and address social challenges. We'll explore what's happening and what needs to happen if we are to create a more equitable, sustainable and resilient future for all. I'm your host, Lee Green, and I'm the Senior Director of Communications and Marketing at the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. Enjoy the show. Okay, so today I have the pleasure of being joined by the New York Times bestselling author, Simon Mannering. Simon is also founder and CEO of We First, um, and has decades of experience working in fashion and for fashion brands as an external strategist and consultant. Welcome, Simon. Great to have you here. Thanks for having me, Lee. Good stuff. So we have about 20 minutes or so, um, so I'm going to dive straight into the questions. So the World Economic Forum recently published their latest global risks reports, and the report states that the next decade will be characterised by environmental and societal crises driven by underlying geopolitical and economic trends. In fact, all six environmental risks feature in the top 10 risks over the next 10 years. So, Simon, my question to you is, how can companies navigate and build a profitable, purpose-driven business in the face of such a multitude of crises? I think it's a great question because here's the reality that anyone in the footwear and apparel industry or even more broadly are facing. These challenges, whether it's the climate emergency or biodiversity or ocean acidification, they're not sitting there statically out in the future waiting for us to arrive. They're actually connected and compounding and hurtling back towards us in the present. And that's creating a hockey stick of expectation on business to show up differently at a leadership, supply chain, culture, and then marketing and impact level. And with that in mind, you know, we're at this very unique moment of transition from the carrot to the stick. And what I mean by that is over the last several years, if in the footwear and apparel industry, you've re-engineered what you do, you'd get some halo effect in terms of your reputation and you know your ability to attract the talent you need and, and conscious consumers buying your product. But now with mandatory reporting and regulations and, and then the rise of you know, increasingly punitive laws that will hold corporate officers responsible for willfully damaging the planet, you're going from this phase of that carrot to a stick where it's getting more punitive in nature. So just as context, I wanted to share that because I believe that leadership moving forward in this industry will be characterized by the ability to deal with multiple crises at once. Because as we've seen over the last three years, we've had COVID, global supply chain disruption, the war in Ukraine, and so on. So what do you need to do? Leaders in every sense, whether in HR, marketing, CEO, CFO, you need to back out of the future rather than build on the past. Now, we've worked with in Europe and Australia and, and all over the US, lots of different footwear and apparel brands. And like many industries, you typically kind of incrementally innovate based on what worked in the year before. That doesn't serve you so well anymore because the future is less determined by the past than ever because of these compounding crises, the half-life of technology, the expectations of younger demos. So all of that is to say that you need to project where your industry is going to be three, five, 10 years down the track and create milestones related to that because that future will be here much sooner than you think. And then more specifically, you need to define your purpose at an enterprise and especially brand level. And you need to think if you're an enterprise Think of yourself as a movement of movements where you have a movement at the enterprise level and then each one of your brands has its own movement of impact that it's creating. And then you need to, on the strength of that purpose, re-engineer your supply chain to make sure you're defensible in public and serving people on the planet. You need to re-engineer what you're doing internally and how you treat your people. And then you need to go out there into the world and communicate in a way that inspires people to buy your you know, footwear or apparel because you, they want to be part of enabling the future that you've articulated. And the last thing I'd say is this. Given the challenges we face, you need to be able to do that in a way that's proactive, responsive, and reactive. So proactive means you plan ahead and you get out in front of it. Responsive is you're showing up in a meaningful way based on what's going on in the world. And reactive is something happened overnight and you need to be better to respond. So there's a few pointers. Okay, great. Thank you. And I guess, I mean, I saw some over the weekend, it just popped into my email. Um, 47% of comms leaders across businesses now report directly to the CEO. I guess from what you're saying there, it sounds like 
the comms departments have a much more influential role and important role in kind of telling that story on on how the brand is purpose driven um, and kind of the influence that that brand will have. Absolutely. I think, you know, comms has moved, uh, well, sustainability has moved closer to the center of marketing than ever because, you know, the expectations of investors, employees, consumers are such that, you know, what you're doing, the role you're playing in the world has become more important. And then, you know, once you've done that, how you communicate that externally is important, but just as important internally with all the cultural attrition that's gone on after the great Mm -hmm. resignation and quiet quitting and all those sorts of things. So then for a company that's looking to communicate about its sustainability performance, be it an ESG report, a complete rebranding, or even something as simple as a blog post, what do they need to look out for and, and what are the pitfalls? And I guess in your experience, and if you have examples, great, how do companies get it right? Well, the first thing, and this sounds really, really trite, but you've got to ask yourself one simple question as a leadership in any capacity. Do you mean it? Because increasingly, the companies that will lead the future will be determined by their integrity of intent. Why? Because the more scrutiny and regulation and oversight that comes to all industries, but especially an industry at the coal face of consumer engagement like fashion, footwear, apparel, the more scrutiny there is, the more those who are playing at it or just managing the optics will be exposed. And that implies that you've got to you know, invest the hard costs and make the hard decisions to re-engineer all of those components of your business that I mentioned before. And the second thing, the hidden gift in all of this is it's not about marketing or comms so much as that when you are doing something with integrity, as a growing number of companies are, then all you need to do is document those efforts and share that through your storytelling to establish your credibility in the marketplace rather than getting it sort of, pardon the French ass backwards and sort of go, you know, hey, we're going to manage our image by creating a campaign or managing the optics of it while we really haven't changed on the inside. And in terms of common mistakes, you know, there are so many things to avoid, but one would be self-directed messaging in the sense that too many companies, footwear apparel industry, especially when they talk about the good work they're doing, they talk about it in a self-directed way, rather than positioning themselves as a platform on which their consumers or even their employees can stand to activate their own agency for change. The second sort of mistake I would say is, you know, you need to have a long-term strategy Um, rather than just a series of ad hoc efforts so that the sum is greater than the parts and it really differentiates you in the industry and builds some resonance or mind share in the minds of all your stakeholders. And the only other thing I'd say is you've got to be really careful to make sure you define a unique and differentiating narrative because the footwear and apparel industry, they're piling into this sustainability, ESG, biodiversity, carbon offsetting space, and you've got to have a unique point of view if you're not just going to get lost in the noise. Yes. So you you mentioned integrity there and, you know, whether a company is genuine about the story it's trying to tell. And, you know, one of the terms that's getting a lot of column inches at the moment is, of course, greenwashing. And even green hushing um, is now getting airtime. So, Simon, what's going on in your opinion? And what to say to those companies who are afraid to say something in case they face criticism for not being 100 percent perfect? Yeah, it's a great question. And I've I've actually heard greenwashing, green crowding, green lighting, green shifting, green labeling, green rinsing, and green hushing. So there's a lot of greening going on, shall we say. And um, all of that is to say is that I think this is symptomatic of the point we are in the, the maturity of the conversation around sustainability. You know, you've got those who you know, see the shiny squirrel and rush to it. And we saw the flight of capital to ESG funds. And then there's the necessary shakeout as people call out whether they're genuine or not. And then there's a reset moment and we start to do it again with greater integrity. So I see, you know, the greenwashing as part of that early stage where people start to engage and pay attention. And I see green hushing as the next stage in the sense that, well, if I'm not doing all things right, I can't say anything because I don't want to put my hand up and get sort of demonized because I haven't got it all right. And that's, you know, especially true when you look at the mandatory regulation about ESG reporting that's coming through. And you also look at some of these um, punitive kind of uh, regulations and laws coming through in terms of corporate offices. With that said, what can you do? The number one thing you've got to do is maintain control of the narrative. And what do I mean? We've worked with many, many footwear and apparel brands that um, are sort of 
caught between the past and the future. They want to do more good, but they're, you know, they're, they've still got some problems from the past. And if you define the narrative, what you're committed to in a unique and authentic and differentiated way, and on the strength of that, say, here's what we're doing well right now, but here's areas that we've got to work on. And you frame those shortcomings as a dynamic dialogue with all stakeholders. We'd love your ideas. Here's who we're talking to. What can we do better? And so on and so on. The reason you do that is if, if you don't control the narrative, then the press will come back, they'll beat you up, and you're in reactive mode, and you've lost control of that narrative. And you've seen that with many, many uh, brands in the industry, where suddenly they're on the defensive, and they're trying to course correct a PR crisis, rather than having framed the dialogue in the first place. And there's no way of avoiding this, Lee, because you know employees, consumers, and investors if they want to buy from you, invest in you, work for you, they want to know the good you're doing because they're worried about their future. So you have to show up meaningfully. You have to do it in a differentiated way, but you have to control the narrative so you don't get into reactive mode. Okay, great. As a comms person, I love that answer. Um, I think yeah. it's right on, on the money. So as I mentioned up top, you've been in fashion in various capacities over the years. As the um, least fashionable person in the world myself, I just <laughs> mind you, I just want to throw that in there. Yeah, my daughters <laughs> will, will attest, but yeah. So, so where do you think the fashion industry, textile apparel, etc., sits at the moment? I guess not only in its move towards sustainability, but also in how it's engaging with consumers, how it's driving collective action, etc. Are there signs that the industry will get it right sooner rather than later? And I guess what's got to change? Well, I think they will have to get it right sooner rather than later, because I mean, I think, you know, textiles and food and energy are those three big sectors that everyone always looks to. And even more so with fashion, you're at the coalface of consumer engagement, where increasing number of conscious consumers pride themselves on being well informed and calling out companies for what they're making or for disingenuous efforts. At the same time, a lot of the strategies people are using right now are getting exposed. Like there was a big report around carbon offsets really being phantom offsets. They really, you know, research into Vera, which is the world's leading kind of standard for voluntary carbon offsets. And, you know, they can be doing more harm than good. So a lot of the strategies that, you know, companies might have gone into with the best of intentions are being exposed as to not really having the integrity we all need. And so what do you do? You know, we've done this work with large enterprises um, that have global footprints and the challenge really is to identify how and where you lead. And the way you do that and the way we've done it is to do an audit of the industry and you look at major competitors to identify where you're best qualified to lead. And so you craft a topography of the landscape where a competitor might be strong in this area, might be diversity and inclusion. You know, someone may be in supply chain management, somebody may be in, you know, um, regenerative, you know, agriculture or otherwise practices, uh, because you can't be all things to all people. You can't try and boil the ocean. So what you've got to do is identify where your unique strengths are that both align with your business goals, but also will carve out something meaningful to all stakeholders within the industry. And then on a higher level, I think what the fashion industry needs to do is they need to lead together. And what do I mean? Sometimes, you know, you sit there as a, a CEO, CFO, CSO and go, well, we're doing everything we can, but are you challenging the whole industry to ladder itself up? Because look at the auto industry. In 2010, when my first book came out, 2011, you know, Tesla was just getting its feet and the whole auto industry piled on to put it out of business. And now every major you know, automaker in the US is committed to phase out combustion engine vehicles. Look at the uh, energy sector and the massive transitions for companies like Orsted in, in Denmark and otherwise. You know, no one's exempt from the challenges of the future. And the whole industry needs to let go of the past in as much as they break new technologies and goals to better serve the future. And that could look like pre-competitive collaboration. It could like look like the responsible packaging movement that Prana in California started. It could look like partnerships between Allbirds and Adidas around carbon calculators. But we've got to have this collaborative leadership mindset so the whole industry is more defensible. And then within that context, you lead in a, in a way that's specific to you. Great. I mean, obviously, at the, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, you know, our work is, is built on that foundation of collaboration and, and finding that shared purpose. And of course, you have a book, you have a couple of books, um, the latest being Lead With We, which kind of leans towards that collaboration piece. And 
It's described as a radical reimagining and re-engineering of business uh, based on the idea of collectivized purpose, showing how we live, work and grow together in new ways that restore and protect the social and living systems of which all of our futures depend. So in short, it's saying we need to find that shared purpose. So how do businesses, competitors, private sector versus civil society, et cetera, find that common ground to drive the more effective change that we need? I mean, one of the most powerful examples is the Sustainable Power Coalition. And I say that as somebody who's been watching it for 13 years. I mean, otherwise competitors or unlikely partners like Walmart and Patagonia and so on came together to create something on behalf of the industry and to create a unified sustainability index. And it was a whole collaborative mindset that up till then had not existed before. And it's just, you know, social proof that it's possible to get it done because, you know, how do we find common ground? I think the question is problematic in its own right. There is no such thing as uncommon ground. We are in this together. We are constantly othering each other or having this false separation between us and them or between people and the planet And the truth is we got into this mess together by the things that I, Simon, bought, by the diet you, Lee, had, by all the things that all of us did unwittingly that have aggregated to the point that we've got carbon in the air, chemicals in the soil, plastics in the ocean, and we're in trouble. And the only way that we're going to get out of it is together. And we need to stop thinking that we're in control or at the top of this sort of ecosystem, this natural world, and recognize that we're part of it. And my great concerns, Lee, are really speed and scale, because these timelines we're working against, they're contracting towards us. And so how do we move further, faster? And there are so many access points, the wisdom of Indigenous tribes, the inherent and sort of awe-inspiring wisdom of soil and mycelia. and, And we just need to shift our minds to working with nature and serving it rather than stealing from it. And but here's the great news in all of this. It's not like we need to do something new we, or learn something new. We need to remember what we forgot because there was a time where we were much more deeply connected to each other in terms of how we see ourselves in the world and connected to the planet that we share. And at the same time, all we need to do is to really ensure that the natural world can do what it does best, which is regenerate itself and unlock that inherent abundance that w- that's within it to restore the damage we've done and give us give us a future that we can all look forward to. And so this false separation between us and our competitors, between this industry versus that, between people and the planet, between I, I just think that's the root of the problem. And it's a mindset shift, which is why I wrote Lead with We, because it really explains how we need to have a new mindset without which, despite our best intentions, we're going to keep doing the same things and we're going to be in real trouble very, very soon. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you're you're clearly passionate about the subject, but are you optimistic about the direction that we're going? I am optimistic for a few reasons. One, there are more hands on the wheel than ever, you know, in terms of people who care because we're awake to the challenges we face because it's showing up so viscerally in so many people's lives, extreme Mm -hmm. weather, lack of access to water, unsustainable agriculture, irrespective of your politics. Secondly, the legion of entrepreneurs who are coming into business to solve for these issues and make money in that order is just awe-inspiring. There are so many companies that are recharacterizing these challenges as marketplace opportunities in disguise. How do we pull carbon out of the air and make new products out of it? How do we make, you know, protein analogs that will allow us to feed a planet without actually sort of industrial farming and so on and so on? And then also, I think, you know, We are all, there is a survival instinct in us all, Lee, that I think, I don't think we want to go out of business. I do think that we are going to show up late. And what I mean by late is this. The way I see it, Lee, is we are hurtling towards a cliff in a car, a million miles an hour, humanity, Mm -hmm. largely. And we've been doing this in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2010, 2020s, hurtling towards the cliff. And as we get and we see the cliff arriving, we've got to throw the wheel 90 degrees Otherwise, we're going to go out of business. And we're all gnashing our teeth at how hard we've got to throw the wheel and how quickly. But the first 15 degrees of that turn is the hardest because the G-forces want to pull you back and hurl you over the cliff. But the second 15 degrees to 30 degrees, it gets a little bit easier. And when you get to 60 degrees, 
it takes on a life of its own and the market forces kick in. And after 60 degrees, you're like, oh my God, how is it any other way? This is self-evident. It's always been this way, right? And so this is just a moment in time where those G-forces are unique to the first 15 degrees of that turn, that urgent turn. And everyone is showing up super meaningfully. There's incredible coalitions and innovations and partnerships, many of which are not being heard about. And I do believe that we're going to get there. It's just we've left it to the last minute. Okay, great. Yeah, I think there's there's plenty of examples out there now that showcase that profit and purpose do go hand in hand. And if if you're not purpose driven, then as you said earlier, you will get left behind. Absolutely. Um, um, okay, so I mean, going back to your book, um, one of the things that really resonated with me was the the virtuous spiral. So I mean, could you for our audience just kind of explain what the virtuous spiral is and, and how it works? Yeah, well, um, you know, we all know the virtuous cycle, which is do well by doing good. You know, Unilever and other brands have made this famous. But my concern and then the work we do where we help companies grow and scale their impact um, is speed and scale. How do we get further faster, as I mentioned? To that end, the virtuous spiral is where we collectivize purpose because there is a, number, a growing number of purposeful companies out there in the world. But by no means is the vast majority of business purposeful. And so we need to aggregate our efforts so that we can meet these challenges with equal force. And so the spiral, imagine in your mind's eye, like a hurricane or a helix or a spiral going up in the air. And there's a number of different levels. And foundational to the spiral is this idea of lead with we. You choose to lead with as many stakeholders as possible in service of the largest we, that is the planet and people. And then there are various levels, me as an individual, me as a leader in the company, my company culture, my brand community, society at large, and then the transcendent level where there's that symbiotic relationship between humanity and the natural world. And as we aggregate efforts, starting with the individual, all the way up through those various levels, it's not just that there are more levels of engagement, they compound, we get the synergies between them, we get the acceleration of results and impact. And like a helix or a spiral, the benefits then flow back down to all the stakeholders involved. So it's about me choosing to lead in my own life and the choices I make, leaders inside companies doing it, fostering that in their culture, sharing it with the brand community that wants to drive change, addressing societal issues through brand movements, and then collaborating cross-industry, cross-sector to really create those results as quickly as they need, they're needed. Great. Well, I mean, it's it's a very insightful read. And I mean, for our listeners, if, if people want to get a copy, where, where can they find it? They can find it on Amazon or wherever you get your books. And I mean, the, what, what I lay out in the book is the insights we've had from 13 years at We First of doing this work with many of the top apparel enterprises and brands in the world. And really, this is not thought leadership or abstract ideas. This is the sort of roadmap that we've developed as practitioners doing it with high pressure, publicly traded senior leadership teams with real stakes over and over again. And they are driven equally by their impact as they are about their ability to drive company growth. And we lay that out in a, in a step-by-step way. And I, and I say we, because it's all a function of the work that we've all done as a team at We First. So, you know, hopefully everyone can embrace it and, and, and use it as a guidebook as we look to the fashion and apparel and footwear industries to be really benchmarks of how we need to show up in business. Okay, so last question and to, to give people something to, to take with them and to, to think about. What three things need to happen, in your opinion, for the average textile and apparel business to get sustainability right? It's a great question. I mean, there are so many things and there's so many great examples out there, as we know, and, and the Sustainable Power Coalition points to so many of these. But one I'd say is commit to collaboration with transparency. You're not going to get there alone. No one brand, no one industry, no one billionaire is going to solve this. And we need to do it together. But we need to do it with transparency. Secondly, I would say that you need to reframe your supply chain as enablers of life. Because for so long, they've been distractive or degenerative or you know, had a negative impact. But what if we simply reframe them and chose our partners and, and leverage the processes that actually serve nature? And so how do they become enablers of life? That will have a massive you know, trickle-down effect through your entire organization. And it'll also serve your communications and storytelling because you'll have things to point to. And then the third thing, and this sounds really, really kind of out there perhaps, 
but as someone who's committed to this himself, spend time in nature and encourage all your stakeholders to do the same. I think the experience of awe, where we've sat on a cliff and looked at a sunset or been on a surfboard or watched a sunset or, or look at, looked at a flower bud and just marveled at how extraordinary it is. When, when you have that experience of awe, you right size our proportion in the world. Because I think the screen living we do blows us up disproportionately. And we think we are suddenly, the world revolves around us. But when we go out into the natural world, we get reproportioned in a way that we become nat part of that natural system. And I think that's so important because I think we're d disconnected from our true nature, who we are as people. We are disconnected from each other and we are disconnected from the natural world. But when we reestablish that connection, a lot of these processes that are innate to the natural world and the humanity's connection to it will be unlocked and we'll suddenly realize we can solve for our future much more easily, but just by just by leaning into who we've always been. Okay, great. Thank you. That's a, a really good message to, to end on. So Simon, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And, you know, thank you again for taking the time to, to come speak to me today. No, thank you, Lee. And thank you to all the listeners for um, hearing, you know, what I had to share today. And just, just know that the Sustainable Apparel Coalition was one of those organizations that inspired my career all those years ago. So much respect and, and here's to, you know, really meaningful collaboration in the future. Thank you again. Thank you for listening today. If you'd like to learn more about the topics discussed in this episode, please check out the links or visit www.apparelcoalition.org. Thanks again and look forward to seeing you on our next episode. Bye for now.